صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم والملائكة يدخلون عليهم من كل باب سلام عليكم بما صبرتم فنعم عقوب الدار If I can ask um, Brother Haroon to come up now, he's the chairman of Nottingham Islam Information Point to talk about the objectives of NIP and the centre itself. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Aur Rahman, Aur Rahim, Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Rasul Al Kareem. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. And peace and blessings be upon the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon whom be peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah be upon all of you. <coughs> Brothers, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank each and every one of you for attending today's grand opening of the Nottingham Islam Information Centre. The NIIC or the Nottingham Islam Information Centre is actually owned by the charity Nottingham Islam Information Point. Now what is it, Nottingham Islam Information Point? The Nottingham Islam Information Point used to be a focal point placed in the city centre of Nottingham nearly 20 years ago, back in 1997. To explain to the people of Nottingham about the religion of Islam. The charity has grown quite considerably to where we are distributing pamphlets and booklets and copies of the Quran in various languages, holding Islamic exhibitions, visiting schools and colleges and conducting group discussions all to enhance the people's knowledge on the correct understanding of Islam. We have mentored those who have embraced Islam from another religion with the basic teachings of Islam, offered them with financial support and assisted them with learning and practicing the required acts of worship. We are a UK registered charity and we are recognized as one of the major propagation organizations here in the UK. Alhamdulillah. We are dedicated in producing Islamic literature in various languages, particularly the Eastern European languages, and we have distributed thousands of copies of Qur'ans in English to the general public. And by the will and blessings of Almighty God, we now have what you are all standing and sitting in, the Nottingham Islam Information Centre. A centre where we can educate and enhance the people's understanding of Islam using our purpose-built Islamic exhibition. A center where the ladies can indulge in glamorous pamper and holistic therapy sessions. A center where the children and teenagers can have some fun down in our state-of-the-art youth center. A centre where we can feed the homeless and less fortunate on a monthly basis. A centre where children and adults can learn Arabic and how to properly read the Noble Qur'an. A drop-in centre for the general public to drop by and have a mug of tea or coffee. A centre for the local community of Radford and beyond for Muslims and for those who are not Muslims, for the young and for the elderly, a unique, charismatic and much needed place here in the community. This is the Nottingham Islam Information Centre. Now I'm sure you are all impressed with what you have seen so far as this particular building used to be a public house called the Moulders Arms, which was purposely built in the 1960s to accommodate the sale of alcohol to the general public. 
and after 50 years the building has now transformed into a local community centre to provide services and activities for people of all ages. For the past two years, since our charity acquired the property, the building has undergone some significant changes. The renovations that we undertook inside this building were that we removed a partition in this very room, creating a larger size room to house the Islamic Exhibition Lounge. We removed two partitions up on the first floor to create a larger size room for the Quran and Arabic schools and to provide a prayer room for the men. We created a loft conversion to use as a stock room to house all of our literature about the religion of Islam. We created a disabled toilet here on the ground floor. We converted one of the previous rooms on the first floor into a self-contained flat to house one tenant. We converted the basement into a state-of-the-art youth centre. We expanded the basement to create extra space for the youth centre. We built an extension above the property which will house a further two tenants and we are now in the process of completing the inside of the flat. We lined out the car park to allow cars to park in an orderly fashion. We have also changed the size of the water pipe which enters the building from a 15 mil pipe to a 32 mil pipe, thus to allow a better flow of water to circulate the premises. As you may have noticed, we have replastered almost every wall to make the building look virtually new. We have rewired all the electrics and ran new pipes for the plumbing. We have had two combi boilers installed and a separate water cylinder to supply hot water to the bathrooms. So you can see we have revamped this entire building only to serve the community. To help make this community safer, to educate and mentor individuals, to facilitate a networking hub, a networking hub to improve our relationships with different ethnicities and to provide refuge and help for the less fortunate. Now to conclude with my opening speech, I would like to briefly inform you all with some of the things that we will be doing here in the centre. And this information you can pick it up from the uh, leaflet racks on the walls or maybe there's some of the tables left out. We will be having here regular classes enhancing individuals different topics on Islam. These classes are for both men and women. Regular social activities for men and women of all faiths. Five regular daily prayers, but no Friday prayers, congregational Friday prayers. Quran and Arabic schools for adults and children, men and women. A dedicated youth centre every weekend for boys and girls. A monthly soup kitchen to feed the homeless. So like I said, all of these classes and activities can be found on flyers around the centre. So without further ado, I would like to pass this platform on to the following five speakers who will briefly talk about the all important aspects needed in our community. Thank you and Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna alhamdulillah. نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا وبعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أهل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون my dear brothers and sisters and the respected guests. So this is a really a tremendous honor to be here on the occasion of this grand opening of this prestigious Dawa Center. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts, your struggles to promote the message of peace, promoting the message of Islam. 
And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you success in this world as well as in Akhirah. So regarding my topic, the, the topic that brother had mentioned about the community, building a strong community and brotherhood is a very beautiful and interesting and informative mess, a message of our beautiful deen. So our beautiful Islam deen lays maximum stress on building a strong community and establishing brotherhood. As you know that even the reward of worship, the reward of ibadah in Islam is multiplied and increased if it is performed in congregation. If that ibadah and worship is performed along with community, you pray at home, it is one salah, it is one worship, one salah. But if the same salah you come to masjids, you stay with community and you perform in the masjid, in congregation, and all Muslims they know. Nabi alayhi salam says that Salatul Jama'ati Tafzulu Salat al Fadli Bisabim Wa Isharina Daraja. That the reward of a prayer that is offered, that is prayed in congregation, in masjid with other people, is multiplied by 27 times. By 27 times, just because you leave your home, you go and you stay with the community. So this is our deen that encourages you to go out and stay with the community. And likewise, if you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you read Quran, you make dua at home, that is a good ibadah. But if the same thing you do with community, you come to masjid, you come to any dawah center, you come to any Muslim gathering, and you stay with them, and you do the same ibadah. So you can't imagine the reward. Nabi alayhi salam says that, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِّن بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ That when people, they sit together, they get together, and they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they read Quran, they share the knowledge of deen with each other. So they get the four kinds of different rewards. First is, إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ sakina Sakina, peace, tranquility descends upon them because of this gathering. وَغَشْيَتْهُمُ rahma Allah's rahma covers them. Allah's mercy, Allah's grace, blessings cover them. وَنَزَلَتْ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَ And the angels, they come on earth, they surround such gathering. So mean they are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned such people in the company of angels. So this is a reward of staying with community. If you look at the Islam, all Muslims they know that بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ ala khams. That Islam, the foundation of Islam, the building of Islam, is based on five pillars. There are five pillars, five arkan of Islam. If you look at all these five pillars, you will know the importance of community that Islam focus, that Islam established in society. First pillar is shahadatu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. It unites the whole mankind. It unites the whole mankind. You can never unite people unless they believe in one God. If every group has different God, how can you unite them? Allah says, أَعْرْبَابُ مُتَفَرِّقُونَ خَيْءٍ أَمِ اللَّهُ الْوَاحِدُ الْقَحَارِ How can you unite mankind when they have different gods? Every group has different gods, they can never be united. This is Tawheed, concept of Tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu that there is only one God who governs the whole system, who rules the whole world. So this concept can unite the whole world. So this is the first pillar. And the second is وَإِقَامَةِ salah To offer, to establish prayer. That was the reason that when our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he migrated from Makkah to Medina, what was the first thing he did there? He built a masjid. Built a masjid because you cannot build a community without masjid. This is a proper place for building a community, strong community and brotherhood. And the second thing that he did in Medina, he established a bond of brotherhood among Muhajir and among Ansar. There were 90 people. 
from half of them from Madi from Makkah and other were from Medina. The Meccan people they had left everything for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And Nabi Salam he established a brotherhood, Ikhwa, Muakhat among these people. And that is a unique example in the whole history of mankind. Allah, you can never find any such example in the whole history of mankind when two different people, one from different country, from different area, from different tribe, they had nothing, no relationship. And they were made brother to, with each other. And this brother, he had offered everything to the Meccan person who had nothing to do with his society, with his community, with his tribe. Like the example of Abdur, Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu ta'ala and Sa'ad ibn Rabi radiallahu ta'ala. Sa'ad ibn Rabi radiallahu ta'ala, he was the wealthiest person in Medina. And Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu ta'ala, he was made his brother by the Nabi alayhi salam. And Sa'ad bin Rabi radiallahu ta'ala, he called Abdurrahman to his home and said, Look brother, you are from this day, you are my, my brother now. So I am the wealthiest and the richest person in Medina. Look at all my business, you can take half of it. Half of my whole wealth. I have two beautiful houses, choose any of my house, you can take the best of your house that you like. I have two wives, you can look at them, and I will divorce my wife and you can marry with that lady. So this was the system that is built on the foundation of Islam. So my dear brother, what did he say? He said, Nabarak Allah fi yahalika wa malik, dullani ala suq. May Allah bless you in your family, in your wealth, but guide me, direct me towards the market. So Abdurrahman bin Awf radiallahu ta'ala, he started his own business and Allah blessed him and within some days he was able to develop his business and he was able to ma marry. So this is the Islam. Likewise, all Ansar, they requested the Prophet or Allah's Messenger We are farmers, we have gardens. So you can divide our gardens among the Makkan, our brothers. But all Muhajir, they said, no, we don't want any share within their garden. So that is the reason. Then they offer them, okay, you work in our garden and we will give you the, the share. So this is our deen that encourages you to stay with the community. All other pillars, zakah, that is the third pillar. Zakah, the concept of zakah is the focal point to develop and to form a best community because this is the only thing that help other people, poor people, rich people to ukhadu min aghniyaihim wa turaddu ila fuqaraihim. It will be taken from rich people, this charity will be taken from rich people and distributed among poor people of the community. This is a concept that you cannot build a community when wealthy people they are getting wealthier and richer and poor, they are getting poorer and poorer. So, This is our beautiful deen. And then, last, well, Hajj and Hajj, pilgrimage, then when all people, they get together, all from the whole world, millions of people, wearing the same dress, there's no difference of rich and poor. All they are standing together and fasting, my dear brother, when rich people, they stay away from eating and from drinking and they share their feeling with poor people. So my dear, this is our deen. That in, and my dear, when we discuss community, our deen doesn't say to stay away from other communities. No. This is our deen. Look at our beloved Prophet Muhammad <laughs> so At the time when his worst enemies were planning to Martyr, martyr our prophet to kill him in the same time they had given kept their valuable things with the, our prophet they had their amana with the prophet how can someone give his valuable his precious thing when he has not mixed with him when he has no, no relation with him that is the reason Nabi Rasulullah says that that may Allah make him disgraceful in this world may his nose be dusted who sleeps at night and while his neighbor, while his neighbor, Wajaru Jai, and his neighbor 
slept hungry. Whether your neighbor are Muslim or non-Muslim, it is our duty to look after him, to, to feed him, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. This is our deen. And my dear brother, this is a unique concept that our deen says, La fadla li arabijin wala li ajami. No Arab has priority over none Arab. All are equal. All are the son of Adam alayhi salam wa Adam min turab. And Adam alayhi salam was created out of clay. All are the whole, are the one community. Whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, all they belong to one community. And our duty is to guide people toward the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our brother effort. May Allah grant him success in this world and akhirah. Barakallahu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidah al-Musaleen wa ba'd. This brother is standing up. There's, there's room here. There seems to be... There's plenty of space, so if you don't feel the need to, uh, to stand up, please come and take a seat. There's still space here. I was asked to talk um, on this very auspicious occasion uh, about building bridges and breaking down barriers amongst the communities. So this is the, the remit I was given. This is the title of, of my um, delivery this afternoon. So the issue we have in our communities is, a, is an issue of misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. And this misunderstanding is not something which is just inherent in the community, our local community, but nationally and in general in the West. Why is this the case? Why is there such a misunderstanding of what Islam represents? We could put it into four, four main areas, the reasons for this. The first reason could be that Islam, only up until the last century and this century, has had predefined borders. And the integration of the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world was relatively limited. It's only with the advent of globalization and, ma and mass migration that we see now the integration of Muslim and non-Muslim communities together. The other reason we can say for the misunderstanding is also that Muslims themselves bear a large responsibility in this misunderstanding. And that is because we find in our communities our understanding of the faith, our understanding of the religion is very limited, is very limited indeed. And when we try and articulate the religion, the faith, to non-Muslims, for some of us, if not the majority of us, we find this difficult. And the, manis uh, the manifestation of this, we see in the lack of understanding of our religion as Muslims, is in extremism. And we can see over the, just the last 20 years how Muslims have unfortunately misrepresented themselves and have done acts which are not within the realms of Islam. And this is still continuing as we've seen this summer in France. So this is the second reason for the misunderstandings. Our lack of understanding of our religion, our deen, and in itself. From personal experience myself, when I was a non-Muslim, and I used to ask Muslims about the faith, they would find it very difficult to explain to me what their beliefs were. They used to talk a lot about halal and haram, what they couldn't do, and what they, mostly what they couldn't do, but they found it very difficult to articulate what the tenets of the, of the faith were, namely the belief in one God. It wasn't until I actually became a Muslim, or early before I became Muslim, that I realized that Muslims actually believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. This was a revelation for me. So the, the second reason for the misunderstanding of Islam lies unfortunately at the feet of the Muslims. The third reason for my analysis of the misunderstanding of, of, our, of our religion is also the, the suspicion, unfortunately, that the West has about Islam. And this is very difficult and very hard to deal with. First and foremost because it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, back to the times of the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, just to name several historical incidents. So this mistrust between the Christian world or the West and Islam has happened for, for centuries on centuries. 
So this is another layer or another issue with the, with the misunderstanding and representation of Islam. And fourthly, the fourth reason for this, the misunderstanding of the religion, unfortunately, is that the media in the West has no real reason to portray Islam in a positive light. In fact, we know with all the, the press cuttings, the newspaper reports, we know how skewed their view of Islam truly is. So these are the four main, I've categorized the four main reasons for the, the lack of understanding of what is the second largest religion on this planet. So what are our challenges as a community here in Nottingham? To, to remove or to try and break down this understanding. The, four challenge, the three challenges rather we face are mistrust, marginalisation of the communities and as mentioned misunderstanding <coughs> I'll give you very quickly a, a brief news article although it's not relevant in Britain it was, it was a news article that was published in a, in a town in Canada but this news article really represents communities or non-Muslim communities understanding of what Islam really is and I'll read it to you so this was a news article that the local mayor of this town in Canada put out in a newspaper and the purpose of the news article was to inform the Muslims and immigrants who were coming to their community their expectations and this is what the news article said we wish to inform these new arrivals Muslims that the way of life which they abandoned when they left their countries of origin cannot be recreated here. The declaration that they, he set out was, we consider it completely outside the norms to kill women by stoning them in public, burning them alive, burning them with acid, circumcising them. It points out that women are allowed to drive in Canada, in their town, vote, dance and own their own homes. Now, it sounds quite comical when you read the... And this, they were absolutely serious when they put this news article in the paper. But what it does show us is that their perception of what Islam is is completely and utterly skewed. Completely and utterly skewed. So this is one of the, 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 the issues that we're facing. A huge mountain we have to climb to break down this misunderstanding and these, and these barriers. In a recent survey in the Guardian newspaper, just last year, a majority of Britons, 82%, do, do not actively practice a religion, and the clear majority of the population, 61%, agree that the days of religion is, the days of religion is now a negative influence in the world rather than a force for good. So 62% of the population in Britain now see religion per se as a, for, as a divisive force as opposed for a force of good. So this is what we're dealing with. It all, they also go, the survey also goes on to say a large majority believe that British Muslims, so this is non-Muslims now saying this, believe that British Muslims should make a special effort to state their allegiance to Britain and this view is, is, a common held, is a commonly held demographic across all regional groups. In other words, it's not just a particular area in Britain where this particular view is held. So what's this survey telling us then? What, what can we draw from this survey? Well, the survey is, is saying two things to us. The first thing it's saying to us is that their appetite for religion, as in organised religion, is not what it used to be 50 years ago. And the second thing that it's telling us is that their mistrust of Muslims is quite deep. The fact that they ask us to actually swear allegiance or they would like to show an allegiance to this country. So the survey in itself shows us the work that we have to do in our community to break down these barriers. So what's the solution? What's the answer? Well, the answer, and we, the Sheikh mentioned it in his speech, is a, one of the most important words a word which resonates throughout the Quran and throughout the Prophet's life what is this word? this word is dialogue 
Dialogue. Conversation. Dialogue is a responsibility that occurs Muslims by the virtue and the nature of our religion. Muslims believe that Islam is the last message and is the last message of the Day of Judgment and as such is addressed to all humankind. We know this as Muslims. These two properties, believing that Islam is the final and the last message, allows us to understand that the University of Islam and requires that Muslims engage in dialogue in the best way. So our belief that Islam is the final message gives us or makes us understand that our obligation is to engage and to have a dialogue with non-Muslims. In fact, the Quran tells us this. In fact, the Quran says, Call unto the way of your Lord with wisdom and fair exhortation and reason them with them that, a, that, is, that is best. And Surah Nahl. Indeed, Islam and is an open world view that never seeks to erect barriers. Islam has never erected barriers between Muslims and non-Muslims. Muslims are driven by the principle of conviviality. In other words, friendship, having friendships, strong friendships. Living together in harmony and not being intent on converting every non-Muslim. We see in the media or in the past when, you, when you, you only have to drive around the country and you see the pubs in the country where you have pictures of the, the sword-wielding Saracen, the sword-wielding Saracen, this perception that Muslims are hell-bent on converting every non-Muslim. This was not the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallam. And Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, there is no compulsion in religion. There is no compulsion in religion. So interfaith dialogue does not need to conclude that there is a winner and a loser. The purpose of dialogue should be not to convert others, but rather to share them with one's principles of Islam. Sincere dialogue should strengthen our faith as Muslims and breaking down barriers. And the Quran makes it clear that the attitude of Muslims should be, and Allah describes this in the Quran, and he says in Surah Kaf, Whoever wants, let them believe, and whoever wants not to, let them disbelieve. So there's a clear choice, and this is manifest in the Quran. And we should remember this with our dealings and our dialogue with the wider community. Finally, when Muslims turn to the Quran and, and the example of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, they will find examples throughout his, his life of this dialogue, this conversation with non Muslims. Not competition. A dialogue is a process, a process of exploration and coming to know each other. Therefore, when one dialogues with others, what is desired is to explore their ways of thinking. We need to understand their ways of thinking so that correct so to correct the misconceptions in our own minds and arrive at common ground. The NIIP will place for that dialogue, sorry, the NIIP is a place for that dialogue and it is a place of safety where that can happen. It is not a place for just Muslims or new Muslims, it's a place for, Mus it's a place for non-Muslims with belief or not. It will at its core have a mission to educate, to inculcate the true message of Islam, dispelling false assumptions, myths and misinformation. And finally, remember all of us, there is no weapon more powerful against the sorts of extremism than education and dialogue. Jazakallahu khairan, subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, ashara la ilal ant, astaghfiru wa antubu ilayk. Alhamdulillahi ala alaih, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu fi awdihi wa la fi samaih, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Amabadu, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm really delighted to be invited to this occasion and I know all of you are delighted to be invited, alhamdulillah, to meet our brothers in humanity, to, to meet our brothers in faith. And this is what Islam is calling, as Sheikh spoke, it's about dialogue, it's about coming together, humanity, Allah create all of us in his wisdom. If you wish you can believe, if you wish you can take your way, it is he who will decide what your fate will be, it is he who will decide uh, whatever, the, whatever decision you take. You cannot take any decision unless Allah 
Allah has a power in that decision. I'm going to speak about Quran. What is Quran? What are the miracles of Quran? What, and what are the benefits of reciting Quran? We believe Quran is the latest word of Allah revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a guidance to humankind and jinn. Before Quran, there were many revelations that Allah revealed to many prophets and messengers. But these revelations were meant to be for specific people at specific time. While Quran is meant to be for all humanity till eternity. So the miracles in such revelations are limited while the miracles in Quran are for eternity because it's meant to be eternal. There are many of these uh, miracles, part of which is the first miracle is that this Quran was revealed to a later messenger. The Prophet وسلم, was unlated. He couldn't read or write, yet he was given a book that challenged all the Arab, all humanity to produce the light. Allah says in the Quran, and you did not recite before it any scripture, nor did you inscribe one with your right hand. Otherwise, the falsifiers will have a doubt. When someone is doing his master's or his PhD and he produced a document at the end of the master's and the PhD, it's rational, it's logical. He was taught how to read and how to write from primary one. He was taught how to make an academic argument, how to read the arguments of other scholars and produce his own argument. But this is the prophet who couldn't read or write. If you write your name, next to the right name of the prophet Muhammad وسلم, he couldn't differentiate between his name and your name yet he produced this document. So had he been able to read and write before it, people would think that, yeah, he produced it from the argument of others. Yet the Kufar of Mecca said that he forged it from somewhere. Then Allah challenged them. If you think he forged it from somewhere, why could he have forged something like that? Allah says, oh, do they say he has forged it? Rather, they do not believe. Let them produce a statement like it, if they shall be truthful. 52, 33. So if you think he produced it, if you think he forged it from somewhere, why can't you go and forge it from that place? They were not able to forge it, then Allah reduced the challenge, and Allah asked them to produce only 10 chapters. Quran comprises of 114 chapters. Since you cannot produce the like of it, why not just produce 10%, only 10% or 9% of it, only 10 chapters? Allah says, oh, they say he forged it. Say, bring forge ten chapters like it and call whomever you want other than Allah for help if you are truthful. They were not able to produce ten chapters out of 114 chapters. Then Allah reduced the challenge and Allah asked them to produce only one chapter. Oh, they say you forge it. Bring, oh, they say you forge it. If you have any doubt concerning this Quran that we sent down to our servants, then produce a chapter of the like of it and call your witness beside Allah if you are truthful. Quran 2 23. Then they were not able to produce one chapter out of 114 chapters. Then Allah changed the challenge. Allah told them that if humankind and jinn were, were to come together to produce the light of this Quran, they will not be able to produce the light of this Quran. Part of the miracles of Quran is that before the coming of Quran, Arab had two ways of reading their literatures either poetry or prose. Then Quran came in a third way. It invented a third way. It is recited. The recitation of Quran is neither poetry nor, nor prose. So it's a, it's a miracle in itself. There are many miracles besides this of the Quran in its purposes. Whenever Quran prophesies that something is going to happen, it is going to happen the exact way. Before the coming of Islam, there were ongoing battles between Persians and Rooms. And, uh, this ongoing battles during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu the Muslims sided with Rome because they are Christians, they have scripture, and the polytheists of Mecca, the idol worshippers, sided with patience. Because why? They don't have any scripture, and they are worshipping fire, so they are like us because we are worshipping idols. And in 613, the battle occurred between the patience and Rome, and the patience won over the Rome's and the Kufar of Mecca were jubilating that the people who received no scripture have won over the people who had scripture. So we are going to want victory against Muhammad. Then Allah revealed Quran that despite the fact that they, 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 they were victorious over them, but in a short time to come, the Rome will be victorious over, over the patience. Allah said, the Rome Empire has been defeated in a land close by. 
but they, after this defeat of theirs, will be victorious. Within few years, with God is the decision in the past and in the future. On that day, the believers shall rejoice. And in 627, the realm had victory over, over the Persians. Many predictions and, pre and prophecies of Quran that come to actualize. The body of Peru, when Allah said, we are going to preserve this body to be a sign to the day of eternity, the body of Peru is still reserved in Egypt. People can go and visit it in museum. Many prophecies. When we come to science, there are many scientific founding that are established in the Quran, many, many, many of them. My respected brothers and sisters, there is a great benefit in reciting Quran. When you recite a later, an alphabet of Quran, you will gain 10 reward. The Prophet wasallam said, whoever recites one, one alphabet of Quran is going to get one reward. And he said, you're going to get 10 reward. And he said, I'm not saying Alif Lam Mim is an alphabet, but Alif is an alphabet, Lam is an alphabet, Mim is an alphabet. When you recite Alif Lam Mim, you get 30 rewards. When you recite Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, you gain 190 rewards. You cannot imagine an action that will gain you reward as much as reciting the Quran. By learning Quran and teaching it, you become one of the best of humankind. The Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, Best among you are those who learn Quran and those who teach Quran. So by learning Quran and teaching Quran, you become one of the best of mankind. On the Day of Judgment, Quran will serve as an intercession. It will intercede for you. It will serve as an intercessor for you. The Prophet, peace, be upon, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, On the Day of Resurrection, Quran and fasting will intercede on behalf of, of the believers. Fasting will say, Oh Allah, I deprive him from his food. I deprive him so, from his drink. Oh Allah, let me intercede for him. Uh, and Quran will say, Oh Allah, I deprive him from sleeping in the night. Let me intercede for him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Their intercession will be granted. You will be granted intercession on behalf of Quran, on behalf of fasting. If you recite Quran, and you are expert in reciting Quran, on the Day of Judgment will be resurrected with angels. And if you are reciting Quran, while you are stammering in reciting, because you are not familiar with it, you will be rewarded twice. Instead of each letter, 10 alphabet, you will be rewarded each letter, 20 alphabet. Your reward, reward will be recited. If you recite in Quran, you will gain blessing in your life. Allah will bless you. Many of the companions, many of the spies predecessors said that when I want barakah, when I want blessing in my life, I add my portion of Quran. The more Quran I recite, the more blessings I have in my life. On the day of resurrection, when we all get to Jannah, our levels will be different. In this world, we have different levels. In Jannah, we have different levels. Who will have the highest level? The people who recite Quran. The Prophet, peace be and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, when you get to Jannah, you will be told that recite and climb. When you memorize only one verse, you will stay in level one. When you recite two verses, you will climb to the second level. In the Your last station is in the last verse you memorize. The more Quran you memorize, the higher your level in Jannah. So let's hold to this book. Let's recite this book to get barakah. Let's recite this book to get blessings. Let's recite this book to preserve this revelation. Allah promised that this revelation will be reserved. Indeed, we are the one who will build the Quran, and indeed we are going to preserve it. It's going to be preserved in the mind of humankind. Let's try it and memorize it. Let's try it and reserve it. I'm really happy to be here. I thank all of you for inviting me and sorry for my speech. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good, yeah? So, alhamdulillah, my name is Omar. And I'm here to talk to you about the youth center held downstairs that we have here within this facility. Um, but before I get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about my professional background. Alhamdulillah, I, work, I used to work with a council, going into communities to develop them, encouraging individuals to become leaders in their society based on sports and activities and games. And so, I have the experience working with not only with the council, but also other projects involved within that area. Working with different people, different ages, from different backgrounds and different religions. They were people from there were people from different abilities and different disabilities. They were difficult people and they were easy people, young and old. And so, use, using the skills that I have gained working with the council, I want to now translate those skills within the youth centre here within the Nottingham Islam Information Centre. 
So I ask, what, what actually is the importance of the youth in society? Well, the children. The children are the future. They're going to become the leaders. They're going to become those who lead in society and continue society. And also, it is important for us to give the youth opportunities that this center will provide both educational and social, but above all, a safe environment. And once those children, if we, if we leave the children, what happens? They become, well realistically, they end up going astray. They end up taking on identities and, and uh, using people who aren't in their best interest as role models. And so they become self-destructive. They harm others, they harm themselves, they harm society, and in result, that causes a social decline. Which is why it is important for us to create an environment here for the youth. A good environment that will provide proper health and provides the proper growth for people to develop in a stable manner. Where they will be able to learn about themselves. They will be able to, sorry, they will be able to learn about themselves, learn about society, and also discover who they are. We aim to inspire again and to create leaders. Leaders that will become great people within society and themselves will teach others and lead others to do greater things. Within that, there, however, sorry, what's that? With that, my apologies. With that, at the least, what we can do is offer some friendly advice. Now, the lack of youth centres in Nottingham, is there one? Ideally, no, there's not. However, there, there are many youth centres, centres in Nottingham, but unfortunately, they are not catered around educational institutes for Muslims, whereas we are. And so it is our objective to provide an education for Muslims, where they will be able to use the youth centre for their own enjoyment, have fun, blow some steam, and socialise with others. Which brings me on to facilities within the youth centre where we will have a safe Islamic environment allowing to people to come and practice their religion, engage in social and productive activities. They will learn and gain knowledge based on the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and to become not only better Muslims but better people within society. We will hold group and individual games and activities with a wide range of games and exciting topics encouraging mental and physical development. But you might ask, who is the youth centre for? Well, anyone can use the youth centre. Not only the youth, but the old. Anyone can enjoy the centre regardless of age, race, gender and religion, so long as they respect each other and respect the facility. Which means, regardless of your religion, you can come to our facility and use it for your own personal enjoyment. Now the class is held within the centre. They will also be able to use the, the, the youth centre downstairs. However, the teacher, the respected teacher of that class will be there to ensure the well-being and safety of those children. Now, what I want to just uh, spring off to is actually encourage the youth and parents to bring their youth to the center. So I encourage you, please, come and enjoy your community center. Bring your family, your children, your friends. Learn about Islam, discover who you are, and have some fun. And I, and I also encourage those of you who have not yet seen our center downstairs to come along and please use the facilities that are available. Now, growing up, I ain't always been Muslim. I reverted a few years ago. However, as a teenager, I actually used to visit youth centers. I used to use them and, uh, just like the one we However, unfortunately, I didn't find that they provided the upstanding, the upstanding rules and safety that they said that they would ensure. For example, you would have all kinds of people coming in, which is fine, we also aim to do the same, but the rules within that were very lax. And therefore, unfortunately, it did create an unstable environment eventually. And hence, those youth centers got shut down. Which is why we are trying our best 
not only to provide this facility for Muslims and non-Muslims, but also keep it safe, healthy, where you develop as a person. Thank you very much. Okay, alhamdulillah. It's time for the summary and the conclusion. Start just five minutes from the biryani, so try and stay with me, inshallah. Okay. So you've been listening to talk for an hour. Sometimes you go away, you've had so much information, and people ask you, what is that centre all about? And you actually don't really know because you've heard so much. Just remember three things, okay? The centre is about three things. It's about the community. It's a community centre, encompassing a Quran school, encompassing daily salah, encompassing a food bank. It's all about the community, the people all around us. Number one. Yes? It's about a dawah or an information center. We all have friends, non-Muslims, colleagues, friends. They want to know about Islam. Masters are doing a great job. They're doing a great job. But where can you bring a non-Muslim friend or colleague where they can look around at posters, they can go on the iPads, they can go into different books, they can have a cup of coffee and find out about Islam? Probably not many places. It's a dawah or an information center. Number two. Yes? Community center, information center, and it's a youth center. So it's just three things. Remember that, okay? Inshallah. You know where we are now? What do we need to go forward? We need three things from you, inshallah. Three things. First of all, your dua. Asking Allah. There is no help, there is no power, there is no sick, there is nothing without Allah's permission. We've had two Imams, I'm not going to add anything in front of the Imams. Who am I? Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing, we need volunteers. What was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, except a volunteer? He helped everyone, human, animal. He wanted to help Muslim, he wanted to help people. We've lost this in our community. You know, we're so, myself, my family, that's it. Where's the volunteers gone now? It's dreadful. There's no volunteers anymore. You can volunteer for the community. You can volunteer for Quran. You can volunteer for youth. Every one of us has got skills. Be a helper. We need volunteers. Okay? Finally, what we need from you, we need money. The community events, they run by money from the community. This is a reality. This has got bills, it has to, a lot of cost. We've tried our best, we're renting out a couple of rooms, but it won't fund itself. If you are able to, if Allah, has, God has blessed you with wealth, give your money, inshallah. These are the three things we ask you for. Okay? And finally, to conclude, there is a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that the one who has not thanked the people has not thanked God. So we need to thank the people who have helped us to reach this noble stage. Okay, so I want to mention a few people, a few organizations. First of all, the Saudi community has stood out in terms of its financial contributions and we're very grateful. One brother in particular, without his donation, we would never have been able to afford this building. He hasn't even come here, he hasn't even seen this, he hasn't even been to Nottingham. But Alhamdulillah, he gave a very generous donation. I want to thank him personally from the behalf of NIP. Without him, we wouldn't have had this building. So as a community, we want to thank. Particular individuals, Brother Raja Naveed Khan, very generous individual, has supported us. Brother Zafar with the, with the camera, supported us, very grateful. In terms of organizations, Keystone accountants stand out, and of course, Pack Foods. I don't think you'll go to any event, any opening, without mashallah, I won't look for Pack Foods being mentioned. So we're very grateful to Pack Foods, who have always been generous and helped us all the way. So I want to thank these specific individuals on the ladies' side. The families of Harun, of Shaf and Hassin, the mothers, sisters and wives, have worked tirelessly. They came in, they cleaned the centre from top to bottom. Sometimes they don't get a mention and we're very grateful to them. Okay? And finally, when you have something like this, you know, two years, somebody is the glue that holds all of this together. You don't understand. Day and night, people are working and one person has stood out. Day and night, every time you came here, one person has been here. Often he's had his kids running around as well. And you know, we really owe this man a great debt of gratitude, and that is Brother Harun. I, I know he's going to look down and like this. I know, I know what Harun is like, you know, I know. But mashallah, we're very, very grateful to Harun. And a few of us, we, we brought him a gift. It looks small, but it's gift vouchers, Harun. You take your family out, inshallah. So come on, come, come, come. So take your gift. Jazakallah khair. We're very grateful. So that's it really, we've concluded, we're finishing now, so what we're going to do now inshallah, um, on the ladies side, they're going to be served their food first of all, on the men's side, those that haven't had a tour of the building, we're going to give you a tour, go downstairs to the youth centre, then we'll take you upstairs, there's plenty of food for everyone, so don't think if I go on the tour, the food will be gone, <laughs> there's plenty of food inshallah, so just relax. 
So those who haven't had a tour, if you work your way downstairs, we'll have volunteers to take you, give you a whole tour of the building. Those who have seen the building, just wait and we'll be serving the food over here, inshallah. Any questions, speak to Brother Harun, Hassan, Shaf or myself. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you for your time.